just going to go over an overview of prion biology and what prion disease is. We'll talk a little bit about the clinical presentation and how a doctor works up suspected prion disease. And then we'll talk about the different forms of prion disease as well. So what's a prion? Prion is what actually causes prion disease. It stands for proteinaceous and infectious. What it is is a transmissible protein. So most things that are infectious have some type of nucleic acid. So that's usually DNA or RNA and bacteria and viruses. But in prion disease, it's just a normal protein that, that changes shape and becomes infectious. Um, it forms in very tight clumps, which makes it very difficult to sterilize in conventional fashion. This is why you have to take special precautions when you deal with uh, prion tissue. And the way the prion protein paradigm works is we all actually make normal prion proteins. That's these yellow dots. And you're going to hear this terminology ad nauseum this weekend, but PRPC. So PRP stands for prion protein. PRPC stands for cellular prion protein. That's the normal prion protein that we all make, mainly in the brain. And then for whatever reason, it comes into contact with the abnormal disease causing form which is PRPSC, which stands for scrapie, which was the first prion disease found in sheep. So PRPSC is what most people refer to as the abnormal disease causing prion protein. And the way it works is that basically the bad abnormal protein converts the normal protein into itself. And you get this uh, exp exponential cycle where you get more and more abnormal prion protein made over time causes fibrils to be made, they break apart, and then they cause more and more abnormal prion proteins to develop. And unfortunately, the only way to definitively diagnose prion disease is to look at the um, brain underneath the microscope. And we do that uh, two different ways. One is through H and E staining. So the pink here is actual brain tissue, and the white is actually holes, or what we call vacuoles. So before we knew that prions called prion disease, caused prion disease, we used to call it spongiform encephalopathy because the brain has the spongiform-like spongiform -like appearance. Um, and then we can take antibodies against the abnormal prion protein and stain the same brain tissue. And you'll see these brown deposits, which are basically deposition of prion protein. So at the surveillance center, which you'll hear about more tomorrow, and we have some people here that do that, um, they do these studies to see whether or not your loved one had prion disease. And of course, there's two ways to do this. One can be uh, at autopsy once the patient has passed, but one can also do a brain biopsy when the patient is living. Uh, we usually encourage people not to do a brain biopsy if they think that it is prion disease, because really there's no reason to do that. You could be harming the patient. You're causing potential exposure. We do encourage people to do a biopsy if they think it might not be prion disease and you need the tissue for the diagnosis or to help develop the treatment. And as we heard in the last session, you can actually have a false negative biopsy because there are some forms of prion disease where the prions aren't found at the top part of the brain where the biopsy occurs. So uh, in order to definitively diagnose prion disease, we do these special histology stains. And then we can do what's called a Western blot. So you'll see a lot of these pictures uh, throughout the weekend. Basically, what this is is looking at the size of the protein. So you can take a sample of a tissue, and you put it on a Western blot. And basically, the lighter proteins are at the bottom, heavier proteins at the top. So they travel down. And what you can do is uh, you can take what's called protease K, which basically eats up all protein except for prions. So if you still see protein lying around when you give someone protease K, then that means that they probably have prion disease. And then we also like to determine what type of prion protein it is. So you'll hear why we care about that later. But if you take a type 1 and type 2 and look at other areas of the brain, you can see this one is a type 2. So we'll talk about why that's important for typing later, because a lot of you guys have questions about that. So of course, prion disease occurs in humans, but it also occurs in animals. So the first prion disease that was described was in sheep and goats called scrapie, because one of the symptoms is the sheep and goat scrape up against fences because they have itching. 
Of course, everyone has heard of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, otherwise called mad cow disease. Uh, chronic wasting disease is a prion disease of deer, elk, moose, and caribou that we have in most of our states in the United States, and you'll help hear more about that later. And then we also know now in the last few years that uh, camels can also get prion disease. And thankfully, they didn't come out with an outrageous name and just decided to call it camel prion disease <laughs> to keep it simple. <laughs> Scientists are a little prone to exaggeration. So uh, there are three main types of prion disease in humans. By far the most common are what we refer to as sporadic. That's about 85% of all cases. What we mean by sporadic is that normal prion protein that we all have spontaneously misfolds. And we don't know why that happens, but we do know that it, it tends to be a risk as you get older, much like other neurodegenerative illnesses like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's. Obviously, that's not entirely true because we see young cases as well, um, but we do truly believe that there is such a thing as sporadic CJD where you get spontaneous misfolding because you can actually do that in a laboratory setting. 10 to 15% are due to a genetic mutation of the prion protein gene, and they're named various things based off of what their clinical symptoms are and what the pathology looks like. So you have genetic CJD, fatal familial insomnia, and gershman strauchler schenker syndrome. And then the ones that we hear the most about, thankfully, are the least common, uh, under 1%, and that's the acquired forms of the disease, or what one might refer to as an infectious form. And that includes Kuru, Atrogenic, and Variant CJD. And we'll go over all of these named ones in detail. So unfortunately, most of you know that prion disease is a rapidly progressive disease. So most people that have the illness will pass within a year. Uh, only about 20% of people with sporadic CJD live longer than a year. Most people pass within four to six months of symptom onset. And it tends to be a disease of mid to late life, um, but if you look at the different types of prion disease, there, do, there does tend to be a pattern. So young people, 20s and 30s, uh, variant CJD, although there have been some older cases of variant CJD, and of course there have been younger cases of sporadic CJD, um, genetic CJD tends to be a disease more of midlife, and then sporadic CJD, again, tends to be more a mid to late life disease. But keep in mind that these are just averages. There's a lot of variation. So in this country, we've had sporadic cases as young as 14 and as old as 104. So quite a wide breadth. So it's important to remember that because a lot of times we'll see on Facebook, um, yes, I lurk on Facebook, that... Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, someone will say, well, you might want to worry that so-and-so has genetic CJD because they're, you know, 50 or 45. Um, you really can't base that diagnosis off of age alone because there's so much variability. So how common is prion disease? Well, the number that everyone is told is one in a million. What's important to remember is that's a statistic that's referred to as an incidence. So it's really helpful for epidemiology, but it's not really helpful for talking to peers and family members about how common a disease is. So the incidence is how many new cases occur per year across the entire population. So for prion disease, that's about one to every two new cases per million people per year. But it's important to remember that not all ages are affected by prion disease, right? It tends to be more a mid to late life illness. So perhaps a better way of looking at how common prion disease is, is how many deaths occur due to prion disease every year. And if you look at that statistics, about one in every 7,000 deaths in the US are due to CJD every year. And I know Dr. Maddox from CDC is probably gonna talk a little bit more specifically about this number. Um, but again, it's not a common disease, but one in 7,000, if you think about going to a football game, obviously not a Browns football game because no one goes there, um, you know, you could have about 20,000 people, right? So, I mean, you would expect about two to three people in that stadium will eventually get prion disease. So again, it's not a common disease, but neurologists, ophthalmologists, psychiatrists, internists will certainly see this disease during their career. So we'll take Ohio as an example. We have about 11 million people. Um, so we would expect 11 to 22 new cases of prion disease every year. Um, again, about 20% live longer than a year, so that's a carryover of two to four cases. So it wouldn't be unusual, and actually would be expected, 
to have 13 to 26 active cases of prion disease in Ohio at any one time. So again, not a common disease, but I think this probably speaks more to your experience than that one in a million number does. Not that the one in a million number isn't accurate, it is, but it defines a very specific statistic that's not really helpful for our cause or our understanding. And when we go for advocacy on Monday, we tend to use the one in 7,000 US deaths, not the one in a million number. Um, so this is just another way of saying that. So this is again looking at that incidence number, so the number of new cases every year if you were to look at everyone, so total, it's again around one. But if you look at older people, so 60 plus, that incidence number is higher. It's about every four, it's about four to six cases per million people per year. And again, that's just representative that not everyone is at risk for prion disease. So it really does count how you describe what, what you're talking about in terms of frequency of the disease. So how do we diagnose prion disease? Again, the only way to definitively diagnose it is to look at brain tissue, but we can reliably diagnose most cases during life. And the way we do that is we look at clinical symptoms. So many patients will have dementia, sometimes not initially, but eventually they will develop symptoms of dementia. A lot of people have myoclonus, that's a twitching of the arms and legs. They may have what we call cerebellar symptoms, which can be ataxia or um, unbalanced gait or in coordination with their arm movements. They can have visual symptoms, so sometimes they'll say their vision is off. In extreme cases, they may actually become blind. And then they develop sometimes a focal weakness, so they may develop a weakness in, in one extremity of the body, and sometimes they develop Parkinson's-like symptoms. So they might have a tremor, or they might have a shuffling gait, or a stooped gait that looks very much like Parkinson's. And we heard, uh, a story from the last session that, in fact, you know, it's not uncommon for people to be misdiagnosed as having Parkinson's disease. And then um, something that tends to happen in all cases towards the end of the disease is something called akinetic mutism, which is just lack of volitional speech or movement. And then we have a variety of different diagnostic tests that we can use. Um, sometimes people will look at an electroencephalogram or EEG, which looks at brain waves. Um, there is a very specific pattern that you can see sometimes in CJD that when you see it, it's pretty specific for it, but you don't always see it. So not all cases have it, and if they do have it, they only have it during one portion of the disease. So in my opinion, EEGs aren't really that helpful for diagnosing prion disease in this day and age, but they are important for ruling out other potential mimickers like seizure disorders. Uh, we have a variety of spinal fluid proteins, but of course the one that everyone hears about is the 1433, uh, and we'll talk about why if it were up to us we would get rid of that. And then uh, of course brain MRI I think is how many people are initially being diagnosed nowadays, and uh, I'll show you examples of all of these. But last year, um, in the fall, CDC updated their criteria drastically. So we have a new test called RT-QUIC, which stands for real-time quaking-induced conversion, which actually detects the abnormal prion protein in the spinal fluid. So it's very specific for prion disease. So specific, in fact, that now CDC considers a case probable prion disease if they have any neuropsychiatric disorder with a positive RT-QUIC. Just to give you a little bit of reference, there is no other neurodegenerative illness that is diagnosed this way. Every other neurodegenerative illness requires a constellation of symptoms like you saw in the first slide. Uh, so that means that we're actually surpassing diagnosis of things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, frontal temporal dementia, which I think is a big positive. So it's important to remember, you know, we heard a lot about diagnostic odysseys, and that is because when people have prion disease, they don't always present like they have prion disease initially. It takes time for the symptoms to develop. And if you look at initial symptoms, um, the plurality of patients will present with some type of dementia or cognitive symptom without anything else. So they may present to a family care doctor or a memory clinic because people think they just have a dementia, like Alzheimer's disease. 17% uh, present, present with a very distinct visual presentation like you heard about
And a lot of times these patients are misdiagnosed as stroke because it's pretty quick, and it's a visual symptom, and then the MRI sometimes can resemble stroke-like appearance. 15% uh, will actually present with a mood disorder, so they may be really depressed or they be apathetic or anxious. Uh, only 13% really present with what we would call that classic CJD look of memory problems, gait problems, and myoclonus. Otherwise, it takes time to develop. And as you guys talked about earlier, a lot of these initial symptoms can be seen in a lot of other things that are much more common and sometimes treatable. So that's why it takes time for clinicians to sometimes come around to suspect prion disease um, because really they don't have that suspicion yet based off of clinical symptoms. And Richard does, goes into really good uh, detail of that and I'm sure he'll talk about that tomorrow. So this is an example of an EEG of, of a patient with CJD. Uh, the classic sign that we look for, these periodic sharp waves. Uh, I call it the EKG sign because usually these are leads all across your, your brain, so they should be doing different things. Oftentimes in CJD, they kind of do the same thing, uh, which is what you shouldn't see, but these spikes uh, are periodic sharp waves. This is an example of a brain MRI. Um, and you'll typically see brightness in two different areas, either the middle part of the brain called the basal ganglia or the outside part of the brain called the cortex. Um, this is the frustrating part. About 95 to 98% of all cases will have a positive brain MRI, but it depends who reads it. So, and of course, we heard stories about that earlier that a lot of times it's misread. Sometimes it's called a stroke. Sometimes it's called artifact. Um, or not even really recognized. But you do see this in um, the vast majority of patients. And a lot of times it's the first suspicion that maybe prion disease is what's going on. So the example I like to give of a, is a person that I saw um, with suspected prion disease, and his chief complaint at the time was um, that he does yoga every morning. And I apologize to people that have heard this 10 times already. But he used to do uh, yoga every morning and he would do headstands for five minutes and he could only do his headstands for two minutes, right? So I'm a psychiatrist, so I see a lot of psychiatric, you know, people that think they have prion disease. Um, his exam was completely normal. His memory testing was normal. This was actually his brain MRI. Um, and he actually died of autopsy confirmed CJD two months later. Um, what had happened was he was in a bike race that weekend. He fell off, hit his head, the neurologist got an MRI saw that, recognized that it looked like CJD, freaked out, referred him to us. Um, you know, one could argue he barely had any symptoms or any symptoms of CJD, right? Uh, potentially he fell off his bike and couldn't do his headstands because he had some ataxia. But really no one would have ever suspected this person of having prion disease. And really it was the MRI that uh, first brought that up. And uh, the situation where I see this the most nowadays is memory clinics. So again, 30% of patients will present with a memory problem as part of their CJD. They may go to a behavioral neurologist or geriatric psychiatrist, but part of the workup usually is an MRI, and that may be the first indication that they might be dealing with prion disease. So I think MRI has been really helpful for capturing cases, uh, especially in cases where um, no one would really suspect it based off of symptoms alone. So moving on to spinal fluid tests, um, at the Prion Center we do three different tests. Two of them are just markers of brain cell injury, and that's 1433, which is either positive or negative or ambiguous. And, um, I would say all of those are somewhat ambiguous when it comes to 1433. Tau, we give you a number from zero to tens of thousands. That's a little bit more helpful because in general, the higher the number, the more likely it is that you have prion disease for the most part. So, for example, if you or I were to get uh, a spinal tap, our tau level would be about 200. Someone with Alzheimer's disease or frontal temporal dementia would be about 300 to 500. But someone with prion disease, it tends to be in the thousands. But what's important to remember, though, is that these are just markers of brain cell damage. They don't say that you have prion disease. They just tell you that you have badness going on in your brain at a fairly rapid clip. So they can be positive in a variety of things, including seizure disorders, head injury, um, rapidly progressive Alzheimer's disease. So they're not very specific for prion disease. However, now we do have a very specific 
test called real-time quaking-induced conversion that is very specific, and you're going to hear a lot about that this weekend. So again, there's a lot of problems with 14.3.3 and tau. Um, you can see it in a variety of things. One could argue, well, why do we still offer 14.3.3 and tau? And our answer to that is that if you look at all the diagnostic classification, 14.3.3 is in all of them. If neurologists aren't up to date on the literature, they don't know to order RT quick. But if they know to order 14.3.3, it will come to us and we'll automatically do the RT quick and then they'll be educated about it. Uh, so we basically include it as kind of a legacy test because we're afraid that we might not diagnose cases if we remove it. But from a clinician standpoint, I don't even look at 14.3.3 anymore. So how does uh, RT quick work? It basically takes advantage of that pre paradigm that we talked about earlier. So we take a 96 well plate and we put normal pre protein in it. And then we add a tissue sample. In our case, it will be spinal fluid that presumably has the abnormal pre protein in it. And then we add a dye called thioflavin T that binds to proteins when they form fibrils. And then for lack of a better term, we put it in a shake and bake oven uh, for 60 hours. And that repetitive shaking in the heat that kinetic energy, if there is prion disease, will cause the abnormal prion protein to convert this normal prion protein into itself. It will start forming fibrils. You'll have uh, thioflavin T will bind to it, and then you'll get these real-time curves that are uh, a positive RT quick. So every case has four, four wells, so this is one case. All four wells were positive. So that's how RT quick works. Um, just to give you a little example of how it compares to our friend 1433, 1433 uh, will, will capture 81% of cases, but um, it, it's only specific for prion disease 43% of the time. So only 43% of the time when 1433 when is positive will it actually be prion disease. However, RT quick will capture 95% of cases and Again, there's no such thing as a 100% test, but as close as you can get to 100% is what we see with RT quick. So if you have a positive RT quick, it's very likely that it's prion disease. So you're going to hear about a lot of other terms during this talk, um, this weekend. So one of those terms is sensitivity. So that's the ability for a test to actually detect what you're looking for. So how good of a test is it at capturing your illness? And then specificity is. Um, how sure are you that that test is actually capturing the disease that you want? So these are both, both important for different reasons. I'm going to ask you to hold your questions till the end. So, um, well, actually, now we're the only one that offers 1433, but usually Mayo also offers 1433. So what we hear a lot of times is that um, a sample may have been sent to Mayo Clinic and they only got 1433. Um, so the differences between the two laboratories is it's done differently. Um, with Mayo, if your doctor orders a 1433, that's all they're going to get back. Uh, for the prion center, if you send it to us, you don't even really need to know what you're ordering. You just need to tell us that you think it might be prion disease, and we do all three tests no matter what. So we actually automatically do the TAL. Um, for Mayo, the physician would have to know to order the TAL, which sometimes they might not. And then the prion center is the only place in the country that does RT quick for clinical specimens. So that doesn't get done if your sample gets sent to Mayo. Um, and then importantly, if your spinal fluid comes back as possibly suggestive of prion disease, um, we'll follow up with your doctor and tell them about um, the CDC-sponsored autopsy program. So I wanted to talk a little bit about molecular subtypes. So again, 85% of CJD is sporadic CJD, but there are seven different subtypes of sporadic CJD. And they're separated based off of a, a portion of the prion protein thing called codom-129, where you can have three flavors. You can either be MM, MV, or BV. That's not a mutation. Everyone in this room has one of those three combinations. That's normal. But for whatever reason, those combinations affect how prion disease presents, age of onset, duration, clinical symptoms. And then you can have two different prion protein types, type 1 or type 2. And again, that's determined by how it looks like on the Western blot. 
So if you have a case of sporadic CJD, again, you're either going to be MM, MV, or VV. And then we tie that to the prion protein type. So that can be type 1 or type 2. And then you get basically these six diagnostic subtypes. So you can be MM1, MM2, all the way down to BB2. So why do we care? Again, they look very different underneath the microscope, and they look different clinically, and their diagnostic test results are different. So for example, MM1 and MV1 tend to be your classic looking prion disease. These are usually the cases that are diagnosed the easiest because they're very quick, their diagnostic test results are usually positive, and they look like CJD fairly early on. Uh, and that makes up about 60 to 70 percent of all cases. But then you get subtypes like MV2 where the duration tends to be much longer. So it's not uncommon to have a year, or two years, or three years, and they look like an atypical dementia. So they may be misdiagnosed with Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, or frontal temporal dementia. And then you have extremely rare forms like BV1, which tends to occur in very young people and have a psychiatric presentation and also has a long duration. And then there's another subtype that's not on here because the pathology is so different that we don't include it called sporadic fatal insomnia, which is basically MM2 with a certain flavor on pathology that looks very different. So um, if you look at your loved one's autopsy report, you should see a subtype, and that subtype will tell you a lot about um, your loved one's disease and, and may actually um, help bring some solace for what you saw. So if you have any questions about the subtype, you can come up to anyone at the, the Prion Center or myself, and we can go over that with you. So genetic prion disease is due to a mutation of the prion protein gene. So we all have the prion protein gene that normally makes normal prion proteins. That's OK. It's supposed to do that. But sometimes if you have a mutation in that prion protein gene, it can cause an abnormal prion protein that is at increased risk of misfolding into the disease-causing form. And then, of course, that can cause genetic prion disease. So there are over 40 different mutations of the prion protein gene, and they're all different. Um, because they can cause different clinical symptoms, they can cause different age of onsets, their diagnostic test results are different. And one thing that's very important is that the penetrance of mutations are different. So when you talk about genetic disease, genetic prion disease, everyone has a 50-50% chance of inheriting the mutation from a loved one. But the likelihood of actually developing the disease, if you have the mutation, can vary quite widely based off the mutation. And that's what we call penetrance, the likelihood that you'll develop the disease if you have the mutation. So for example, there are some mutations where the penetrance is almost 100%. So GSS, fatal familial insomnia, um, if you have that mutation, you're very likely to become ill if you live long enough. And then there are some where it really determines on the age. So for example, with E200K, which is actually the most common cause of genetic CJD, uh, it's close to 100%, but you'll see a lot of variability. So most people don't get ill until about 65. But I have a 94-year-old gentleman that I follow every year who, who has the mutation, and he's alive and well and doing fine, um, despite the fact that his mother and his daughter died of prion disease. So we really don't understand why penetrance works this way, but it's something that we're actively trying to figure out because obviously that would be important to know. And then there are some mutations where the penetrance is very low. So for example, V210I, um, the penetrance is only about 10%. So it's not uncommon for these cases to not have any family history whatsoever because the likelihood that someone would develop the illness if they have the mutation is actually low. So if you come from a genetic family, it's very important that you know what mutation you have and also that you know what the penetrance is. And if, again, if you have any questions about either of those, just come to us and we'll help explain that to you because it's very crucial that you understand it. So again, there are different genetic prion diseases, the most common of which is genetic CJD, which as you would expect resembles sporadic CJD. A lot of the diagnostic test that we use for sporadic CJD is also positive in genetic CJD. There's fatal familial insomnia, which is caused by a very specific mutation. 
um, that presents with insomnia and neuropsychiatric symptoms. Uh, they do develop dementia, but typically late in the illness. So these cases don't typically resemble what we would consider prion disease until the end. And unfortunately, a lot of their diagnostic tests are negative. So 1433 is usually negative. RT quick is usually negative. MRI is usually negative. So it's a very difficult disease to diagnose unless you know there's a family history. And then another genetic prion disease called gershman strauss schenker syndrome, or GSS, um, I would argue doesn't look like a prion disease at all in many people because it's of longer duration. So it's not uncommon for people to live five years or longer. And they tend to present with an isolated uh, balance difficulty or Parkinson's-like symptoms that can last many, many years. And again, a lot of the diagnostic tests that we use to diagnose prion disease can be negative in GSS. So it also, I think, is a difficult um, genetic disease to diagnose unless you know there's a family history. So one thing that we hear a lot about is, well, why would I want to know whether or not I carry the mutation? Um, and the reason for that is you can actually do things about that now. So we can say two things. One is uh, nowadays you can actually do um, what's called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis with in vitro fertilization where you can have biological children and only implant embryos that don't carry the mutation. So that kind of guarantees that future generations won't have the illness. And that's very, very empowering. And there are multiple people at this conference that have had that done. And I believe you'll hear some stories about that as well. Am I correct, Debbie? A little bit, OK. If you have any questions, we'll point you out to the people that will talk about it. And there's this, a very good book about one of our families uh, who's a board member, Amanda Kalinsky, uh, and her struggle with her, her father's illness of uh, GSS, her um, odyssey of getting tested, and then also she went through that process as well. And then, of course, the second reason to get tested for prion disease is, excitingly, we actually have a drug company that's interested in maybe helping us, and I think it would probably help the genetic people the most. So moving on to acquired prion disease, um, Kuru disease was the first really uh, prion disease that was discovered in humans, and it really is how we uh, knew that it was transmissible. So it affected the Papua New Guinea tribe and uh, Boray tribe in Papua New Guinea, and it basically affected uh, women and young children that had this kind of ataxia, rapidly progressive dementia, and no one really understood what was causing it. At first, they thought it was a genetic illness that no one really knew about. But then the anthropologists got involved. And as they studied the culture, they realized that as part of their death rituals, uh, they would consume the corpse of their loved one. So probably what happened was someone in the tribe had sporadic CJD. Their loved ones would consume them out of respect. And then it was propagating the disease. So what's interesting is it was only usually the women and young children who partook in the mortuary feast. So that kind of describes the pattern that they were seeing. Um, and then once you outlawed cannibalism, when Australia colonized Papua New Guinea, you can get a sense of what the incubation period was. So incubation period is the time of exposure to the time that someone becomes ill. And uh, what we found out was that the incubation period can be up to 52 years. So that's important to know because there are other forms of acquired prion disease, and it's important to realize that incubation periods can be many decades long. So iatrogenic CJD is basically medically induced or transmitted prion disease. There are a couple known uh, transmission risks for this, corneal transplants, uh, neurosurgery, dura matter, and growth hormone when it's taken from a cadaver. Um, and in the US, most of our cases were human growth hormone uh, as well as dura matter. And unfortunately, we see the same thing. So uh, last year, we had a, a case in the US um, of human growth hormone, iatrogenic CJD. And she had been exposed to human growth hormone 42 years prior to becoming ill. So unfortunately, with this disease, and this is why surveillance is so important, is it doesn't stop at the exposure. You have to keep following because people develop illness later on. So thankfully, nowadays, we know that there's a risk of using uh, neurologic tissue 
from cadavers and humans. So a lot of times we don't do this anymore. So human growth hormone is now made in a lab. Most dura matter is made synthetically. And for corneal transplants, they have to go through a, a vigorous screening to make sure that the donor had no neurologic illness. You'll see at the very bottom is blood transfusion. That's a very specific use case scenario, and that is variant CJD or CJD due to mad, mad cow disease. Um, that's the only recognized form of prion disease that's transmitted through blood. Um, there's a theoretical risk for sporadic and genetic forms of the illness, but no one has determined any epidemiologic risk for those forms. So, again, prion disease is a transmissible illness, so we hear this a lot from families. What is my risk of caring for my loved one? And what I like to think of it rather simplistically is that there's a couple criteria. So the first criteria is that infected tissue has to be taken from the central nervous system, basically your brain. And then it either has to be placed into the central nervous system of another individual, injected into them in large quantities, or ingested in large quantities. Now, nowadays, we don't do most of that. So, you know, the risk of acquiring CJD is very limited to specific procedures. Again, there is the exception of variant CJD by blood transfusions. So if you ever tried to give blood on the screening, questionnaire that I ask you about your time spent in the UK and also whether or not you have any family members with CJD. So variant CJD, again, is due to eating meat contaminated with mad cow disease. Uh, it tends to have a younger onset, so in their 20s, a longer duration, so not uncommon to have a duration over than a year. And they present with a lot of psychiatric and sensory symptoms. And unfortunately, before variant CJD was really recognized, Many of these young children were thought to have a primary psychiatric illness and spent time in psychiatric wards, some receiving electroconvulsive therapy, which was pretty distressing, I think, to families. Uh, a lot of their diagnostic tests are negative. Uh, they do have a positive brain MRI, but it looks different from the one that I showed you. It's a very specific finding called the Paul Munner sign. So if you remember the last brain MRI I sent you or showed you, um, you saw brightness in the basal ganglia in the outside part of the brain. Here, it's in the part of the, the brain called the thalamus, or pulvinar nucleus of the thalamus. Sometimes people refer th to this as the hockey stick sign, because it resembles a, a female player's hockey stick. Um, the mad cow uh, disease outbreak primarily occurred in the UK, so most of the cases of variant CJD were in the UK, followed by other European countries. To date, although millions of people were exposed, thankfully only 231 cases of variant CJD have been detected. You'll see that we've had four cases of variant CJD in the US, but all of those were thought to have been acquired overseas. Again, this is why it's important to continue to do surveillance, because if we were to find a case of variant CJD that's not explained by um, overseas travel, we'd want to know that. So the mad cow epidemic started in the 1980s. Um, we realized that mad cow disease was basically a man-made epidemic because we were refeeding cattle to each other. And once that was stopped in 1996, you can see that the kind of mean incubation period was about 10 years and has steadily uh, dropped since then. But just like with Kuru, just like with atrogenic CJD, they're going to continue to see cases uh, every few years probably for a while. So, uh, you know, one could argue Millions of people were exposed to mad cow disease. Why didn't more people get sick? And if you look at appendices, which variant CJD can reside in there, it looks like um, people can asymptomatically incubate prion disease. Um, and basically, a study showed that about 1 in 2,000 people uh, could be silently incubating the disease um, that were exposed in, in the UK. So variant, or Chronic wasting disease, you hear a lot about this, is a very scary prion disease of deer and elk. Uh, they're a free-ranging animal. It's excreted in their saliva, urine, and feces. Uh, of course, in the US, we're very concerned that potentially humans could be exposed to chronic wasting disease and develop illness. We don't have any evidence for that so far, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening or couldn't happen. So we have to continue surveillance for that. Uh, so basically, those questions. So in summary, prion disease can be caused by a misfolded protein and be transmissible in certain circumstances. There's three primary causes, uh, sporadic, 
genetic and acquired. And uh, brain tissue allows us to definitively diagnose the disease, but I think you'll hear, especially this weekend, that we do have a lot better diagnostic tests than, once, than what we once had even as early as four years ago. Uh, everyone likes to end with a picture of their lab. <laughs> picture of my lab. Uh, and I'm not kidding, she actually takes this proene, which kind of looks like prion. Uh, but this is actually the, a picture of the surveillance center who you'll hear more about tomorrow. Uh, and there'll be a panel and they'll tell you a little bit more about what they do. So I'm sorry for running over. Uh, no time for questions. Mm -hmm.